It's Monday night. Okay, so welcome to the cricket pitch. The bassist just uh, just sort of um, caught a glance at the symbol. Then that was an accident. Okay, it's that sort of thing. That's what you can look forward to this evening. So it's a a cricket podcast with music, the usual sort of stuff. So um, please welcome the host of the cricket pitch. It's Emma John. John. Uh, this is the Cricket Pitch. Uh, it's a, for those who want to know, it's a Guardian Live event as part of the Guardian membership. And for those who are wondering what you're going to be getting, uh, what we're going to be trying to do here is combining cricket and comedy, which is actually an idea we got from England's One Day performances recently. Um, boo? What? Uh, I mean, the difference is England uh, did have six months of preparation. Uh, for those, and we have done no rehearsal whatsoever. So good luck, technicians. Um, also, just in case you like to know these things, there's no interval. Uh, so the show runs at 75 minutes, which is um, slightly uh, shorter than a 2020 innings, and marginally longer than Paul Downton was in charge of English cricket. Um, we actually were planning, this is our first show of 2015, uh, we were planning to do a World Cup highlights show. <laughs> yeah, you got that. Uh, yeah, we couldn't get the footage of England beating Scotland. Uh, it is obviously looking a lot better at the moment. Um, England have just beaten the West Indies in the second test in Grenada, which is their first overseas win in two and a half years. Um, we will be talking about that and other things with our fantastic guests. But first, I would like to introduce you to my co-host, Alex Horn, and his band, The Horn Section. Thank you, Emma. Well, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Emma. Quite rowdy in here. Yeah, they are. A bit nerve-wracking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm all right, thanks. Would you like to meet the band? I can tell you who they can, are. Can we meet the band? Well, we should do, because they're not. They're, uh, we've got Ben Reynolds on drums, Joe Auckland on trumpet, there's the bassist, and we've got Ed, Sheld <laughs> Ed Sheldrake on piano, so pretty good. Um, and have you guys all been watching the cricket? Uh, well, Joe and I have. The others are not fans um, of cricket. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I watched the first four days of the uh, last test and then thought it was going to be a draw, so I gave up. Which is no. Shame. Yeah, that normally happens. It's um, actually it's, it's a good one to watch the West Indies tour because it, happen, it all takes place at the right time of day. You can actually go home and watch it. What is the right time of day? What do you mean by that? After work? You don't really have a job. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not yet. No, OK. Um, I, I felt bad about the bassist. Do you want me to introduce you? Yeah. Can we get, like, a big response for the bassist? Like, like a standing ovation for the bassist? I know it doesn't feel like that situation, but it would be nice for him, I think. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's Will, the bassist! <laughs> yeah! Oh, yeah! Yeah! Come on! the room. He's a member of the National Front. Um, I'd, I'd sorry, love to... Sorry, it's the National Trust. Sorry, yeah, member of the National Trust. <laughs> member of, what did I say? Front. Oh, shit, sorry. I would love to get an idea from the audience of how they, uh, how they feel about cricket. Is that okay? Mm. Um, I, I just, I'm just wondering who... who if, so, show of hands, who uh, here thinks that uh, England beating the West Indies in the last test was a sign that they've turned a corner and that things are going really well. <laughs> okay, there's, there's, there's a few. Okay. Uh, who thinks it's a sign that West Indies aren't, aren't very good opposition? Okay, right. And who, who wrongly thought they were coming to a folk gig and is waiting for Alex to do some sea shanties? <laughs> yeah, I knew there were, I knew there were some. Um, okay. We are, we're going to start off by introducing to the stage a comedian whose um, passion for cricket is, I think it's safe to say, inexhaustible. Um, he gives his address on Twitter as One Cricket Street, Cricketsville. Um, he, he's also got an incredible, uh, incredible mind, which is more full of data than Peter Moore's hard drive. So please welcome to the stage Andy Zaltzman. Hello. 
How you doing? I'm all right, thanks. Excellent. Um, we uh, we last did one of these shows last year in Edinburgh. Yep. At the festival. England unbeaten in Test cricket ever since then. Yes. So I think that's <laughs> probably the turning point in the history of our recent recent cricket. Yeah. Um, we we learnt a few little interesting things about you then. Primarily, the thing I remember is that your favourite player is Chris Tavares. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I, I grew up in, in Kent in the 1980s, and uh, I, who, who here is aware of Chris Tavery? And who has never heard of Chris Tavery? What are you losers doing with your lives? <laughs> uh, Chris Tavery was uh, uh, a, a Kent and England stalwart in the early 80s, who batted, he wasn't so much that he batted negatively, he batted as if he was trying to eradicate the entire concept of hope. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, I really relate, I, I, just, I just love that, that total lack of consideration for the paying spectator. I think that was kind of very much of its time. And, you know, he was, you know, standing up against the Great West Indians, you know, doing a job for England in the S. Ian Botham scored 118 at Old Trafford in 1981. At the other end, Chris Tavery, I think, went from 41 to 38 in the same time <laughs> whilst both of them were scoring that inning. So uh, he was a hero, Brilliant. big hero. Um, so you have had an interesting year, I think. You've, you've been, you, you did something quite exciting at the start of this year. Uh, uh, what, New Year's Day? Um, no, uh, no, oh, I mean just oh, since, I since you know, I went, I went to the World Cup um, to report on England's um, first appearance in the World Cup um, final since 1992. And it didn't entirely pan out. Um, and, and England got a lot of criticism. Uh, for me, they were the team of the World Cup because I think um, you're going to have to bear with me on this one because uh, I didn't get as much credit as I believe uh, they they deserved. Because uh, I think sport has become far too professional, far too serious. Uh, you know, people, particularly the Australians, it's all about winning for them. But that's not what sport is about. Sport is about happiness. It's about joy. That simple pleasure we we get from playing sport as children. And England realised that. And they, through their World Cup campaign, gave a lot of people a lot of joy. Um, Australians, New Zealanders, <laughs> Sri Lankans, you know, 150 million Bangladeshis had the fucking party of their lives, <laughs> thanks to England. You didn't see Australia spreading that level of happiness with their selfish attitude towards sporting excellence. No, but England did that. We made the world a happier place. We did. So where were you watching from? Were you in the stands or were you in the press box? Uh, a bit of both. Um, uh, uh, the press boxes are quite stuffy places. It, you kind of um, think it should, be, it, it should be full of people just sitting there thinking, I cannot believe I'm doing this for a job. Whereas what it is in fact full of is people thinking, I'm doing this for a job. And it's that's just an important difference, I think. And uh, so they're quite kind of stuffy places. So how did it go down? Because I heard that you went to a press conference and took a puppet of W.G. Grace, a knitted puppet of W.G. Yes. Grace, and asked, who was it, Alistair Cook? You, you asked players questions in the voice of W.G. Grace. Well, <laughs> no, that was actually in the last World Cup that I took the knitted W.G. Grace to press conferences. He didn't have press accreditation this time. Oh. But, uh, <laughs> But I, um, I asked Andrew Strauss in, in the last World Cup in India when England had, had a series of really exciting games as opposed to this, this one when we just got mercilessly <laughs> annihilated. Um, uh, and um, uh, I said, you know, do you think uh, this is the most exciting uh, series of matches England's had since W.G. Grace was captain? And then Cook looked at him and said, it looks like he's lost a bit of timber, which um, I thought was quite impressive for, for Strauss. That's pretty, that's pretty quick. I mean, Strauss, Strauss is, uh, uh, he got in, in trouble last summer for... Uh, uh, what he said about Kevin Peterson on air. Um, yeah, do you remember that? Uh, and uh, I think Strauss was very unfairly criticised for that because uh, he's a very, very busy man, Strauss, as, as you know. Not only has his cricketing commitments, but you know he's very interested in politics and other things. And he just doesn't have time to use, uh, use uh, full words. So he uses a lot of acronyms. And he described Kevin Peterson as a cricketer of unbelievable natural talent. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I feel like uh, you were... Um... So I'm just telling you, I had to look up a stat on it before I came on. Well, actually, I was going to ask you about stats next. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but right. did you have a favourite World Cup stat? Because I feel like if anybody had a favourite World Cup stat, you would have done. Oh, uh, favourite World Cup... Uh, oh, no, I'm not... Uh... No, there wasn't no, one. I'm not sure. You see, I, th no, I, I like the fact that Bangladesh had never scored a hundred. Uh, no Bangladeshi batsman scored a hundred in the World Cup, and then Mamadullah got two 
in two games. I mean, I made Bangladeshi World Cup hundreds like London buses, <laughs> in that they didn't happen between the beginning of time and the year 2015. <laughs> and then there were two within the space of five days. <laughs> Uncanny. Um, where were you when uh, England went out, uh, when, when England lost that game to Bangladesh? And I was out? back home in London. <laughs> this tournament, this is how stupidly long the World Cup was, that I, 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 uh, I went out for the first two weeks, came home for two weeks in the middle, and then went back out for the last two weeks. And basically, I didn't miss anything apart from England getting knocked out. That suggests that the tournament is too... I think the ultimately decisive factor in the tournament was not which team was better at cricket, but after that marathon endurance of six weeks with not that many games, which team actually still liked playing cricket? And I think <laughs> the Australians just edged it. Yeah. I, went to a, I went to a Ken Dodd gig once. I, watched an, I genuinely I watched an hour and a half of it, then nipped out, watched a football match, had a curry, came back and watched the second hour and a half. Like, <laughs> it's just, you know, I thought it was a similarity with the tournament. Yeah. I thought I'd chip in, really. It was very much the mm. Ken Dodd's gig of cricketing That's what tournaments. I was trying to say, yeah. yeah. I've written you a question, Andy. Can I ask yeah. you a question? Fire away, Alex. So I'm sort of trying to imagine, if, if comedians were cricketers, yeah. then I've got sort of... Uh, Vaughan would be like Jack D, you know, your, your Gower, obviously, because of all the... Right. All the, you know, all the hair and all that. Yeah. What, who would be Peterson in your book? Which Kevin, oh. We've got Bell is Russell Howard. Um, <laughs> Milton Jones is Swanee, because he's, you know, he's wacky, isn't he? <laughs> he's a laugh. Kevin, Kevin Pete, well, he, mm. he splits opinion, doesn't he? I don't know who's the most opinion-splitting comedian. Carrot. Uh, Jasper Carrot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, he certainly split opinion in the International Criminal Court when he was tried for war crimes. Was that, I know that was Radovan Karadzic, wasn't it? Oh, that, um, <laughs> okay. yeah, it must be the same family, isn't it? Now, that Carrot must have come from that. Yes. He's basically Brumman. Jasper Carrot, an escaped war criminal. I think so, yeah. Is that your answer? Uh, that's my answer. Yeah, is that, but, is that, that's well, what I had that, yeah. Is that the correct answer? Yes, yeah, oh, right. good, excellent. <laughs> good. Well, um, unless Alex has got anything else. No? Uh, oh, he has. Well, few, yeah, but this is a different show. Uh, <laughs> different, different um, uh, well, so since we've solved that, we, it, I'm very excited about our next guest um, because, uh, because I'm not going to lie to anybody who uh, was a fan of, uh, of cricket in the 90s, um, you're, you're going to be excited about this. Uh, it is England former bowler. Dean Headley. Hello. Right. Come and have a seat next to Andy. How are you? <laughs> Before we start, Dean, I've actually written, uh, for those people who aren't, weren't fans during the 90s, I've, I've written a potted history of your life. Would you mind if I read it out? Okay. I've sort of done it in the form of a eulogy, so can we have some quite sad music? <laughs> Dean. Warren Headley was born on the 27th of January 1970. He shares his birthday with Mozart and Sir Francis Drake and Mark Owen, the little one from Take That. Unlike Mozart and Drake and the little one from Take That, Dean Headley is an English cricketer. He was born in Stourbridge, which is a place, but he does come from a famous cricketing family, being the first test cricketer to be both the son and grandson of test cricketers. Also, his twin brother is Graham Gooch, weirdly. <laughs> in 1989, when I was just 11, Dean played for Worcestershire's second team. In 91, he moved to Middlesex, then Kent, then he played for England between 97 and 99. At that point in my life, I was working in budgins. Still, we've all ended up here tonight, so he's not necessarily better than me. <laughs> he's currently a cricket coach for Stamford School, and he sports West Brom, West Bromwich Albion, but that's in a different, slightly more popular sport. He is Dean Warren Headley! I certainly do support West Brom, boy mm. boing. Lovely. That. Boy boing. <laughs> Premiership, mm. still, this year. We're getting on. <laughs> Do you want me to ask the first question, or do you, do you want to ask anything? I've written one question, but for later on, if that's okay. right. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Uh, well, this is more of an observation than a question, Dean. I, okay. I feel like, um, I don't know if it was in that intro, but I know it's on the Wikipedia page on your Crick Info page that you know you played 15 tests uh, for England. I'm just checking I got that right. No, that, that is question. right. Yes, one um, of those didn't really exist. Well, really, I played 14. One got cancelled. The Jamaica Savannah yeah. Park. It was my best test match. I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> didn't bat, bowl, or field. I just, I, I just was so surprised when I saw the, the number 15, 15, 14. 
controversial mm. um, because um, it just you loom so large in in our memories of of nineties cricket. I mean, you you made such um, when when you bowled, you did make a, an impact, and you know we have great exciting memories of you uh, bowling the Aussies out at Melbourne in ninety eight ninety nine. Um, I think that was our only win in the 90s, though, wasn't it? <laughs> Is that why I remember it so well? Possibly, possibly, right. yes. Um, I played my last first-class game at 29. I um, cracked my spine. Um, and in those days, the rehab and the way that we looked after players was not the same as it is today. So if I'd been playing today, I don't think it would have ended my career. Um, I think they would have treated it very quickly and my career would have gone on, but it didn't. And But that's... I, I don't commiserate the years that I've lost. I actually celebrate the years I've had. Well, so. it's certainly, I think it's testament to an, an incredible career, however brief that, that you know, it's, it really does, you know, we've got such shining memories of it. Um, uh, I was going to ask you about Caribbean tours because players always say that Caribbean tours are their favourites. And Australia. And Australia. Yeah. Well, you, yeah. Is, that, is that true? So what, what is it that's so special about... Caribbean tours. Well, when I toured, what was great about tours, there was no Facebook or Twitter. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, David Graveney always said to me that we played the last years where you could properly enjoy tours. And after each game, we would go out for a drink. We'd, um, you know... Bomb. A drink? Just one? Yeah, it's a bucket. <laughs> um, and... You would, even if you lost, you went out, and, and it was no different to, I think, that if you went on tour with your, with your club side. You'd play the game, OK. We wouldn't drink before the game, but certainly we'd need a drink after the game. What about during the game? Um, you go out for a meal. Um, surprisingly, during a test match, I don't know what it's like now, and I'm sure they've got their, their food weighed, and <laughs> this is how much you've got to eat, because you did this today, and you've lost that amount of energy. And, and it was like... Uh, We'll have a curry tonight. We'll have a Chinese tomorrow. We'll have an Italian. And you wouldn't get the team eating together. There'd be four of you would go to that restaurant and three would go out there or one would, two would have room service. So they, they just, you got a, an allowance like you would if you went on work with, if you were working for a company and they gave you an allowance and you went out and spent your allowance. Because now so, they're the backroom staff of about 850, aren't they? <laughs> they do, like they kind do. Kind of a team of 55 chefs and recipe yes. books. and They have been known to lose yeah. players, yes. yes. Energy drinks, them. sommeliers. They've actually lost players in amongst the staff. They have, yes. Right. That yes. what happened to James Taylor. Well, yes, <laughs> about, to be fair, he fell down the stump <laughs> Um I'd, Yeah, there, there are a lot. And is it right? Yes, yes, I think in some degrees it is. But I think that... England have lost the, the or have done, I think Peter Moores is bringing it back slightly. As a sportsman, you've got individual responsibility. Um, you can't blame your coaches. Coaches can help you, they can't make you better players. Um, so there's a lot of talk about, oh, the coach can't be good or whatever. Indian players, I don't think they need coaching. I think you just need a bit of guidance and a bit of, probably put your arm around and say, do you know what, you are brilliant. Oh, I needed that in my out. village career. <laughs> so when I, when, I play, when I played, there was a lot of negativity. It was all about England going out and not losing it, whereas now it's like, how are we going to win? And my, if I was going to criticise England at the moment, I think we're very formulaic. We have plans and we stick to the plans and there's not a lot of spark factor. Anderson the other morning had a spark factor. Board has it every now and then and I'd just like to see a bit more of that. Yeah. You, you play with... Uh, Goffey in uh, yeah. that that, uh, yeah. that tour of Australia where you had that great. Um, well, he was like a kid, Goffey. Yeah, I, mean, I guess he like brought that, that spark factor. Well, Goffey was literally. It was like, do you think you could move that house? Yeah, I could move that house. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, you know, if you, you, Goffey is the only person I know that talks about himself constantly, and nobody minds because it is like listening to a 12-year-old boy <laughs> who's just very excited about what he does. If you bought a car, he's had a bigger one. Uh, if you've been on holiday, he's been somewhere hotter. <laughs> if you've been to a ski resort, he's been somewhere colder with more snow. But he does it in such an um, enthusiastic way, you can't go, I don't like that bloke. Um, he's, he's the person that I enjoyed playing cricket with. I only played four test matches with him. I did tour with him. Um, he was contagious. 
uh, that he's infusing it. He believed, yeah, OK, boys, uh, we've got, um, they've, Australia's got 10 wickets left and they need five to win. <laughs> and he'd be going, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, um, as, as you mentioned, your tour of the uh, West Indies is quite an interesting one um, because the first test was abandoned because the pitch was so bad. Um, and I have heard, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard that the players, the England players might have actually sort of celebrated when they heard that it was called off because they thought that was one more test that they didn't have to play. Is that true? Uh, Phil Tufnell underneath the bench in the change room, <laughs> using it as a bunker, definitely <laughs> celebrated. Um, and then, unfortunately, they found out that, no, you, they'd rescheduled another test and you still had to play one. Yeah, this is the English way, you know, we're, we're under the cosh. West Indies had a decent team at that time. You know, they weren't exactly over the hill by that stage. And uh, it was always typical English. It was like, uh, you know, they must have phoned up the, uh, the ECB and said, you know, we've lost the, the, the test match hasn't taken place. What should we do? I know, play another one. <laughs> when everybody knows if you're second favourite in a two-horse race, you need the race to be shorter, <laughs> not longer. <laughs> and you were thinking, we're thinking, great, four test matches, we've now got a proper chance. OK, no, we play back-to-back -back test matches in Trinidad. That's the ECB, that's English being fair. We, we've sort of got to get out of that and play, <laughs> you know, Sri Lanka tour, England, what should we do? Should we play on quick green bouncy wickets? No, we'll play on quick wickets at turn. Brilliant. <laughs> and how did, how, did the, how did you get treated when you went, went um, to, to the Caribbean? Because you, you, were, you are sort of, you are cricket royalty really over there, aren't you? Uh, in Jama I went to Jamaica when I was 18 and um, it was, uh, everything I did got reported on. So I played in all the Jamaica warm-up games and everything um, because Ryan Can I was um, an ex a player that played with my dad. So Ryan Can I said, "Yeah, no problem. Uh, he can come and play all the tour games and everything like that." So I went out there, and but it was embarrassing because on the news, the Jamaican news, they go, uh, "Yes, Jamaican tour game, Jamaica so and so against Jamaica." another name, and it'd be Jimmy Adams, 174 not out. <laughs> uh, Daryl Morgan, 50 runs not out. Dean Headley's one not out overnight. <laughs> <laughs> but they reported on everything that I did. Um, Jamaica, yes, a lot of Bayesian rivalry between Jamaica and Barbados, so therefore got a little bit berated in certain islands. Um, you know, who am, who am I? Am I West Indian or not? I'm half. I'm half West Indian, half um, English, though. I remember playing at Barbados, and it was really hot and in the bleachers, and all I could hear was a lady just saying, Headley, I'd love to rub oil all over you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd break every bone in your body. <laughs> but it, it was a bit disconcerting, so... <laughs> That's an unusual form of sledging, that, isn't it? <laughs> it was, and, and you are concentrating, and, and the old ground at Barbados was very on top of you, and this lady was making no certain terms she wanted to be on top of me. <laughs> so I did this for about ten overs and just listened, and she just kept saying stuff about me, you know, about my bum cheeks, and... <laughs> And I turned around and this lady must have been 28 stone, <laughs> sitting in the bleachers with her legs about this wide, with a skirt like this. <laughs> and she just berated me all day. Well, not berated me, sort of a little bit of a compliment. She came on to you all day, well, she, what yeah, happened? Yeah, she'd never have caught me, I'll tell you. <laughs> I think Andy wanted to ask you a question. Yeah, actually. yeah, so um, your, your grandfather, George, one of the greatest batsman in the history of uh, of cricket did you um, Black the, 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 mm. yeah and uh, incredible statistics in the, the pre-war era did you um, how well did you did you know him growing up I, loads of people talk about him I, I, I said something at the back about Michael Holden Michael Holden as a schoolboy played uh, in a competition and George gave out the cup to him and he signed Michael an autograph and it was like, to Michael, play cricket and travel the world, George Headley. And to, to Ma Michael still got that. Yeah. So to a legend that I look at Michael, and then Michael looks at my granddad, great. Um, you know, George was, George was something special, but I only met him twice. Really? Yeah, just met him, uh, met him when I was about 11 and 13, just before he died, yeah. Right. So, yeah, it was, uh, I mean, Michael Atherton, 
His nickname was the Black Bradman. Michael Athlin actually calls me the Beige Bradman. <laughs> <laughs> no, he says that's got something to do with the colour has faded. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what he used to call me. I think Alex might have a question. Athers, so naughty Athers. Um, <laughs> okay, Dean. So in nineteen ninety-eight, you got your six second innings wickets mm. at Melbourne uh, to win the match for England. How often do you think about that? <laughs> well, if you want to a once a week, <laughs> b once a year, or c every now and then. Uh, once a week. Really? <laughs> yeah. I think about it about twice a week. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be fair, people mention it so often, so... Uh, but if you do want to steal anything out of my computer, probably use MCG98 and you'll get everything out of it. <laughs> Brilliant. The, Thanks, the, the, uh, the commentary... Uh, have you seen Bill Laurie's commentary? No, I haven't. No, it's, no. It's, it was... Uh, spect as uh, you were running through the Australians, he, he just absolutely lost control of himself and was, was wildly overexcited. That's unusual for him. <laughs> and was uh, screaming, Headley could be a hero here. Hail Headley, they'll be saying. Now, can you tell me, has anyone ever said <laughs> Hail Headley to you? No, no, but I'll tell you what, there must have been about 200,000 people in that ground because there are so many people who have said, I was there. Right. <laughs> I can tell you, I was definitely not there. I was watching it on Sky in Brixton and I went to bed at the tea interval thinking, we're absolutely done here. <laughs> and I a lot of people left on, on yeah. the ground on the day, and, um, but then I think one of the reasons why people remember me so well is because I think it meant so much to so many people, that particular match. Darren Goff said it's, a, it's a, his favourite test match he ever played in. Um, it was just, we were backs against the wall and it was just out of nowhere. Yeah, but, like I said, memorable. Very memorable. Um, we're going to play a game now, which I hope the audience might, might enjoy getting involved with. Um, regular Guardian readers, of whom I'm sure the audience is of course full, because this is a Guardian membership event, um, will know that uh, we encourage discussion uh, 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 below the line, as we call it, on our pieces, uh, which basically means that we, we open up our pieces to uh, for, for people, anybody they like, to, to comment on them. And the, the, the things that get said below the line, they... they they're frank, let's put it that way. <laughs> they, uh, um, it's also a place where people like to vent certain frustrations and um, get pretty excited. Um, uh, people always have a lot to say. So I thought that what we might do now is just, is just, just I've just taken three comments at random uh, recently and, and they are describing England players and I would like you to try and um, tell me from these below the line comments who, let's work out who they are. So if we can uh, cue the first comment. His batting tells you all you need to know about him. Coming into the team, it didn't seem like he knew the handle from the toe. Now he can drive through the covers with the best of them. <laughs> Does uh, any, anybody either on stage or in the audience got, got a thought on who that might be? Jimmy. Monty Panesar, Jimmy. I've got to say, Jimmy, I'm going to give it to you straight away. It's Jimmy. It's Jimmy. And there we go. <laughs> Clearly knows, uh, knows the bat from, knows the toe from the handle now. Um, what was... They were really talking about it. Oh, believe me, these things get weirder. <laughs> to be fair, I thought that was Ian Bell. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this one? He's like a bidet in a bathroom. Looks classy, but nobody really knows why it's there and what its use is. <laughs> any, any ideas from anywhere? Current player. Is it? What was that, Rabbi? Rabbi Papara. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you this one because actually, Dean, it, this one is Ian Bell. This, Ian Bell. This one's Ian Bell. And That's actually quite old, isn't it? I, I, no, that was a recent comment. That recent. was that was posted in the last week, and here is a picture of Ian Bell having scored his 143. <laughs> Silencing those below the line critics. <laughs> I motivated mean, him. yeah, I, I was just going to say he's a pretty powerful B day, really. And, and do they have to like sign their name to what they're saying? Oh no, we we we, we believe in just... we believe in free speech. It's just anonymous lunatics, basically. It's, a, <laughs> it's the 21st century equivalent of shouting at traffic. <laughs> but it is a principle we hold dear at The Guardian. He got 20, um, he, so he's England's highest ODI score, <laughs> and he's got, what, 20 test match centuries, something yeah, like that. No, yeah, good, though, in, the, in the no last good. nine he's tests, he's, he's... In the last nine tests, he scored 350s and 250s. But that, I mean, it's... That's, B days are useful, you yeah. know? B days are great things. So what's the, what's the next one? This is the last one. 
Choir boy, his dead eyes suggest something more sinister, if you ask me. <laughs> well done, absolutely. I mean, I actually don't know what they're talking about. Um, we've, we've got a few more. We've got a few more comments actually, which we will we will flip to in, in a sec. With the, these are not. Um, the, the, this is not. This isn't for a game. This is just. I wanted to um, share some interesting things that people had said below the line on Jimmy's um, recent um, test uh, on the day that he broke the record. And there was a piece about him online. I thought we might just kind of look at how people were celebrating and what they were saying about him below the line. Do you so want me to Alex read them out? Yeah, 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 please. Do you want to play some just music underneath it? Just something. Ed, your normal stuff. Or press demo. Whatever you want. Really. <laughs> Be fine. Okay. So. Uh, Colin Whitehead wrote... Oh, yeah, cute slide. I just can't work out how people can get excited by this. Is it that we're all leading such boring, meaningless existences that a banal piece of news like this can somehow be interesting? Am I missing something here, or is the human condition really this destitute? <laughs> Gerda Clamp has the answer. Please tell me which pub you drink in so I can avoid it. That's the first one. And then some his historical satire, Let Them Snort Coke, has written... Never heard of the guy. Not a big cricket fan, obviously, but congratulations. Sam Stone. He wrote, don't know a thing about cricket, but if, if this is good, then go Team UK. Four exclamation marks. Where is the scorecard? Shouts to be a pilgrim. Very hard to find the scorecard on the Guardian website. And then finally, Fridge. Right, Gary Balance, Gary Balance, Gary Balance, Gary Balance, Gary ba and so on. Copied and pasted? Uh, yeah. I don't understand that one. Either that or he was just having some sort of seizure yeah. at his keyboard, I think. Those are genuine comments. Um, genuine comments. Joe Auckland, the trumpeter here, um, is actually a big Jimmy Anderson fan. He's uh, following on from this. He's written a song about Jimmy Anderson's uh, achievement. So he's going to sing that. He's going to use the worst of all instruments, the banjo. So. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, there isn't an interval, but if you want to have a go and get a drink, it's sort of not a bad time for that. How are you, Joe? Fine, thanks. Mm -hmm. How am I? Oh yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah good too. Also yeah. good. Yeah. There's a right arm from Lancashire so strong and true and fast That it's made the history books by leading the first class It's left so many landmarks in its terrifying wake Nobody knows how many more wickets it can take Oh, oh, oh Jimmy Anderson You're our all-time greatest wicket taker We really must congratulate you well, It's important at a time like this to remember times gone by The trailblazers that paved the way and set the bar so high So rave a glass to Beefy cause he'll always be remembered He made quite sure of that when he tweeted us his member You're our all-time greatest wicket taker oh, oh, but Beefy, don't despair You're still our favourite picture taker But a place in all our hearts can't be bought with only wickets You'll need to break some records outside the world of cricket Maybe host a barbecue with a legendary spread then eat seven burgers and drink four bottles of red Oh, oh, oh Jimmy Anderson You're our greatest wicket taker oh, 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 but Beefy, don't despair You're still our greatest burger maker Well, your cricket's perfect pin-up with your natural flair and style your sultry, brooding temperament we'll remember for a while. But if you want to leave us with a lasting legacy, you'll need convictions for ball tampering and for smoking weed. Oh, Jimmy Anderson, you're our all-time greatest wicket taker. Favourite lawbreaker, and, and you look like, like 
pick up the tater. Mr. Joe Walken there. How are you? Very nice. Thank you. Well, I think it's time. Thank you very much for that, by the way. That was beautiful. It's all, all very well, that, Jimmy Anderson stuff. Who had the better test average, though, Dean? That's <laughs> what it's all about, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, he might have it, a few more wickets than you, but... Oh, I don't know, actually. He <laughs> might have the better test average than me, yeah? Oh, he doesn't. I've checked. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank God for that. Next to the stage, we are adding a bit of uh, music cred to our lineup. Um, we uh, are very excited to... <laughs> <laughs> Lovely song, though, guys. Lovely song. <laughs> We're very excited uh, to have uh, an indie rocker, I believe they're called. Is that, is that the right term? Indie rocker? No, no not that. Um, Indian, I think. <laughs> uh, he's, he's a guitarist uh, about to go on, about to bring out a new album and embark on a big tour of the UK and the US, uh, touring with Mumford & Sons. It's Felix White of the Maccabees. <laughs> Uh... <laughs> Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Sorry, that was actually the worst intro ever, but I don't really know anything about music, as you might be able to tell. Yeah, I can tell, yeah. <laughs> but these guys are very good, I think, so, yeah. Thanks, Felix. Coming from an indie rocker, that means a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you're, you are um, super busy at the moment, I know. Yeah, pretty busy. Well, not... That busy because I'm on a cricket show, <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, what are you doing in your spare time then? It is, it actually is. But yeah, we just made a record, and we're about to go on tour, as you said. And um, your single is out now. It is correct. Yeah. What's its name? Marks to prove it. <laughs> Marks to prove it. There we go. Um, and um, so, so if you're so busy, yeah. Um, uh, how are you keeping up with cricket? Well, cricket's on all the time. <laughs> and I've got um, Sky Go, so whenever we're in the studio, it's just always there, somewhere. Yeah. So, you know, cricket's been quite a big part of my life, so I'm quite rarely without it, to be honest. And how do the other band members feel about this? Um, they've got used to it. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we've been asked to do some um, sort of cricket associ association dinners and stuff, but um, they never want to do any of that stuff because they don't care, really, who Michael Affent is or anything like that. <gasps> is, it, is it good but, money? To me. <laughs> is it good money? Sacrilege. What? Is it good money? Because we'll do it. We'll do it. <laughs> is it good money? Is it not? <laughs> you get free waters, though. Free waters? Yeah. OK. Yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> yeah, we'll do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. I, I saw that you did manage to take um, Florence Welch to the Oval once for a, for a Surrey County yeah, game, Yeah, she came... Well, she lives right by the Oval, and I've known Florence for a long time. So she was kind of, well, you get to go and walk on the pitch, don't you, at lunch? So she went on the pitch, and then suddenly half the Surrey team were with us. <laughs> so we had a little game of cricket with Xander de Bruyne at Slip and stuff like that. <laughs> and she's oblivious to it all, like, you know. And a bit, it was a magic moment for me, that. I don't think such a memorable moment for her in her career, but, yeah, it was great for me. So Surrey is your home team, is it? Yeah. Yeah, our shooters at Elephant and Castle, so it's just down the road. And, and how... <laughs> I, I, I feel like there was a reaction, but I don't even know. It was such an insipid reaction. I don't, I don't know what it actually meant. Um, uh, how, how long have you been a, a Surrey fan? Well, since I was 10. Oh. But it's not as um, partisan, is it, county cricket? No. Because like, my favourite cricketer was always Phil Tufnell, which no one seems to mind too much, but he was from Middlesex. Oh, but he should have been a musician. Phil? Yeah. He's he had the demeanour of a musician, didn't he? he? he yeah. Yeah. That's I've an actually, interesting one, actually, because he, yeah, he if was anybody, if you put him, yeah, If you spoke with anybody and put him and say, what job does this bloke do in his heyday? Yeah. With a fag <laughs> and a drink, and you think musician. I was always fascinated by why. that. Was he trying not, hard, Phil? Because he never looked like he was. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, His nickname's a cat. Yeah. So when he's not on the field, he was sleeping in the corner. Yeah. So yeah. that's how he got his nickname. Yeah. Right. He was doing that when he batted quite a lot as well, wasn't he? <laughs> why did you like him so much? Because he couldn't feel, couldn't bat, but he could bat. Well, I couldn't feel or bat either, so I had oh, an right affinity then. with him. But it, I thought there was something really beautiful about the way Phil Tufnell bowled. Mm. And he was kind of an anti-gladiator in a lot of ways, because people really loved Phil Tufnell. Um, and I think part of that, because we... Because we would probably behave the same way he did in a lot of test matches, you know what I mean, if we put in that situation. What, like run away from Kirtley Ambrose? Yeah, and just, <laughs> just get up and, <laughs> and uh, drop catches and things like that. 
Yeah. But to, to take it away apart from me, he's a beautiful spinner and he had such a lovely action. And the flight was just magic. And I, yeah, he's my favourite cricketer. Probably. He used to jump in the air when he took a wicket. All left arm spinners have got that little, yeah. that little flick, didn't they, at the end of it? The great Are ones. You're a left arm yeah, spinner? Yeah. <laughs> I've got a flick. That makes you, yeah, but that also makes you mad. <laughs> I've not met a straightforward left arm spinner who's not mad. Yeah. To be fair. Alex, are, you, are you mad? I, I, want, I want to watch this. This is yeah. developing. Am I mad? Yeah. Do you have to spin it to be called a left arm spinner? No, you've so. just got to be mad. <laughs> <laughs> Free water. <laughs> <laughs> Alex. Well, I, well, I'd written a, uh, or crafted a question for you, which was, uh, if musicians were cricketers, mm -hmm. so I've got, I had Tufnell down as Damon Albarn, actually, and I've got Phil Collins as Phil Edmonds, because I think they're the same person, pretty much. <laughs> I've got you as James Anderson, because very handsome. Very good, good looking. Thanks, babe. Who's KP? Who's Kevin Peterson? Who's the worst musician? Well, who's the... <laughs> who's the <laughs> He'd be a lead singer, wouldn't he, Kevin Peterson? Yeah. Morrissey's good. Morrissey's a good shot. Johnny Ball, maybe. It'd have to be Marmite, wouldn't it? Either people would love them or hate them. It's, it's tough with KP because I was in Australia and there's a lot of actually affection for Kevin outside of England. And it's quite interesting. Uh, you know, they've got quite an interesting take on it out there because they think that he just speaks his mind and he's a majestic cricketer. Bear in mind, he is our next guest as well, just so you know. He's, <laughs> he's <got this. laughs> Uh, yeah. Um, y you've actually been reading KP's yeah. book, Andy. So, uh, fascinating. I thought I'd share some excerpts from the uh, book. I don't know if any of you have read it, KP. Uh, it's shortlisted for the uh, Booker Prize <laughs> for, uh, for fiction. Uh, also, um, uh, he produced uh, not just a book last year, but a computer game as well, Kevin Peterson Cricket 2014, in which he had to play as little cricket as humanly possible. <laughs> and then, but I thought I'd share a couple of excerpts. Uh, this is when he started uh, falling out with some of the uh, dressing room. I began to feel unwanted in the dressing room. Matty Pryor hit a cover drive for four. He was looking at the ball really intently, like he wanted to hurt it. And then he smashed it with his bat really hard. <laughs> and I thought, what if he was hallucinating that that ball was, in fact, my head? <laughs> Later that evening, I was dozing off in my room when the ghost of W.G. Grace appeared to me in a vision, told me that he was miles better than me and that I was fucking shit. I was starting to feel that the England cricket hierarchy didn't want me anymore. Um, then, uh, when he started falling out with uh, Strauss and Flower. At times, I felt completely isolated. Before a one-day international against New Zealand, I came into the dressing room to find Andrew Strauss dressed in ceremonial robes, chanting a pagan prayer. I'm sacrificing an ox. <laughs> what are you doing, I said. I'm trying to make sure we win the toss, he replied. <laughs> the blood splattered all over my shirt. Andy Flower screamed at me. Why the fuck aren't you wearing your England wipe clean tracksuit? You know it's sacrifice time. <laughs> but I'd always believe that to win the toss, you have to sacrifice a goat. You sacrifice an ox when you want the pitch to spin. I couldn't play with these idiots anymore. <laughs> And then uh, <laughs> there was this allegation, allegations of bullying by some of the senior bowlers of some of the junior players. There was this young time when young Bertie Schnizelswitz Sanchez, the Israeli Mexican who just qualified on residency, <laughs> was the 12th man. He fumbled a ball at mid off, and Jimmy and Brody ran up to him and screamed in his face, You've just ruined our whole careers, you uncoordinated pile of shit. <laughs> they dragged him off the field by his ankles, tied him to the massage table in the dressing room, stuck electrodes on his nutsack, and then waterboarded him. <laughs> Eventually, of course, he cracked and confessed to having unnecessarily conceded a single. <laughs> as, as well as plotting to blow up Parliament in 1605 and planted the evidence on Lee Harvey Oswald for the Kennedy hit. So, shocking scenes in the England dressing room. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. I wanted to ask you. I wanted to ask you a little bit about writing, actually. Um, yeah, in, in terms of, of, of lyrics, mm -hmm. um, have you ever written anything cricket-related into into lyrics? No. No. <laughs> I, did, I, I, I had I had a quick look. So, and I, I saw that you um, that the Maccabees have a song about about swimming, um, um, but you still haven't done a song about cricket. Um, and you've, you've got, I think, I think the, the, there's a line in the chorus, Latchmere's got a wave machine. Yeah. 
So, I mean, why can't you do a cricket one? You know, like, I mean, Streatham's got a bowling machine. <laughs> what, 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 why haven't oh, you written about cricket Clapham yet? Common's got free nets. Yeah. yeah. They're in terrible order at the moment. They are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll have a think about it, but I imagine the majority of my non-cricket loving band will probably be against What that. about hidden you can have messages? Have like, if you want. Would they know, though? Would they know? They don't know any names of players or anything. They wouldn't know. You get your name in there, please. <laughs> Joe, were you just inviting Felix? I'm just offering our song to Felix if, if he'd like it. Oh, yeah? You can stick it on your album. OK, cool. Yeah, um, yeah wicked. Because <laughs> 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 there's a lot of... There's be just stick it on the album. Yeah. <laughs> just stick it on. What about, what about hidden, hidden messages? Because, you know, some bands like... Was it Judas Priest was supposed to put messages about the devil and if you played it backwards? Yeah. You know, have you played any of your songs backwards and found hidden messages about Ian Salisbury's bowling or anything like that? Oh, Ian Salisbury. Yeah. Great. Sorry, oh, sorry oh, Stalwart. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of cricketers who want to be in bands as well, aren't there? There's a, there's a big... There's a big thing where cricketers quite often think they'd rather be in yeah. bands than be cricketers. I think Graham Swan is is in a band. He Mark is in a band. I've Butcher's seen his got band. a band. What, his, what's his band name? It's got a really something about the lurid revelations. Do, yeah, so. Doctor Comfort and yeah, the yeah. lurid revelations. He's a bit of a, as you can imagine, he's a sort of Liam Gallagher type frontman. Yeah. Graham Swan. Yeah. Tambourine. Mark Butcher's got a band. Mark which... Butcher's actually a great musician though. Not the Graham Swan isn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the Butcher's subtext of that was Graham Swan isn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, best, but Mark Butcher's a proper guitar player. I love Mark Graham Butcher. Graham Swan yeah. thinks he's one. <laughs> yeah. Although, at the moment, Mark Butcher's band is just called the Mark Butcher Band, so I think he could probably have a think about that, maybe. Yes. Um, and yeah, then Dougie, Bre Brown, Dougie Brown, his wife is in a uh, sort of operatic uh, band Dougie called Brown. Elysium. The yeah, yeah, yeah. His his wife is uh, in a something called Elysium. So there's always been a big connection with cricket music. There is a big connection. Music. There is. Ray Ellingworth was the fifth Beatle. <laughs> 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 well, t t talking <laughs> talking about this connection leads us very nicely uh, onto uh, onto well a little encounter I had in the West Indies. I did actually I did go to the Caribbean specifically for this. I had to go on a fact-finding mission to Antigua. It was really important that I went and travelled out there. Um, and uh, one of the things that I discovered uh, while I was there is that, um, is that uh, well, I'll tell you the story. I w went to a beach party, again, fact-finding, and, um, and there was a band playing. It was quite dark. Um, they didn't have very good lights on the stage. And the guy who was um, playing guitar at the front had, uh, was wearing a West Indies um, uh, T-shirt, uh, you know, West Indies cricket shirt. And, um, and, I looked, and I looked and I thought, that looks like Richie Richardson. And it was Richie Richardson. Um, and it turns out that Richie Richardson and Curtly Ambrose are in a band called Spirited. And they have actually just brought out their first music video. So who would like to see a little bit of Curtly Ambrose and Richie Richardson's first music video? Let's, let's watch that. <laughs> <laughs> it is a bit like the question of sport mystery guess, this video. <laughs> They're sort of all blurred out at the back. You've got to guess which ones they are. <laughs> Does anybody who knows more about music than me know what this song is? Because it's a cover. Anybody know what this band is? Maroon 5, yes, well done, yeah. Maps by Maroon 5. Um, in fact, actually, I feel like we just didn't get to see enough Kirtley there. So um, there, is, there is a little bit of the video where you do get to see Kirtley uh, a little bit um, closer up. Can we see, can we see that? Again, question of sport, mystery guest, fade in. There he is. I mean, Dean, what I would say is, is that the person who used to terrorise England batsmen? <laughs> Do you know what? It, the West Indies terrorised you, but they did it where they didn't speak to you, which is like, it's like being tortured and the person talks to you and he's just looking at you, which is disconcerting. <laughs> they never swore at you, never said anything at all. Yeah. And actually, they're so nice off the field. It, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't a case of just trying to kill you. 
that, well, they did kill you, but they were nice about it afterwards. So. <laughs> this is this is exactly what I discovered. So I I, um, I actually at the end of the uh, at the end of the uh, gig, I I went and caught up with them, and um, I was quite apprehensive, obviously, uh, especially because Curtly is like this big. Um, but um, they that thin. And that's him. Uh, they actually sent us a little message. So can we can we see that? Hello, London. We're beautiful Antigua, sunny Antigua. Just watch your life when you have any beautiful time. Really should be here. It's beautiful. Antigua Heights. Hello, London. This is me. Come here. Just watch your life. So all the Londoners, all the UK friends, come on over to Antigua. You're missing out. Richie Richardson's maroon sun hat. Ooh, yeah. That's the first time I've ever seen. I'm pretty sure he slept with it on. <laughs> I don't think he ever took it off in his entire cricketing career. Well, have you, you ever seen without a sun hat? No. no you may uh, have noticed uh, that was night time. I've never been to bed with him now. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was night time. He said sunny Antigua and it was obviously pitch black behind him because it was night time. So it wasn't actually sunny at the time. Um, Felix, I was going to ask you about your um, trip to the World Cup. Because you, like Andy, did go to the World Cup, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I went, yes, yeah, like for two weeks. Um, one match. I, I, I turned up. <laughs> I saw three. <laughs> I turned up as soon as um, England flew out and I flew in. And Jimmy had sorted me the tickets out. So I turned up in Australia and I was like, it took me about three hours to get the guts to go, does the quarterfinal ticket still stand type thing? <laughs> but he did, bless him, sort me out still. <laughs> And it was just yeah, it was a time in my life, to be honest, actually. E Especially even though England weren't there at all? I think it was better because England weren't there, <laughs> to be honest. Because I was amongst... In India Bangladesh, I, I mean, you've probably been to test matches of Indian fans, but it is, like... I can't even tell you how euphoric it is to be at a cricket match with people that care that much about it. It was really um, a yeah. wonderful experience. If yeah. you imagine the scenes when, when England won the Ashes in 2005 and they had that massive uh, open-top bus parade screaming crowds in Trafalgar Square. That's pretty much an Indian crowd after India scores a single. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, that's, that's the thing. For me, one of my biggest memories was um, I thought the Barmy Army were brilliant. And I find it real shame that they will not let them organise for them to stand on our own ground. But they're brilliant away. And, and for me, that's probably one of the biggest memories of, of touring. Yeah. The support they gave and and dying support because they, we didn't win much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, they were just superb. Yeah. And, and I mean, well, we didn't win much in the World Cup, to be fair, this, this World Cup either. Uh, um, did, how did you guys, how did you guys find, what were the things that you did enjoy since there wasn't much to enjoy from, from England? It wasn't, it's funny, it wasn't a great World Cup, was it? No, games Most World Cups aren't, though. Really? Did, did yeah. you find that? They, they seem, I don't know, the ICC seems to deliberately go out of its way to concoct the least exciting possible format for a World Cup. Yeah, what is that about? I think they're just fuckwits. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a technical, technical cricket Technical term. Term. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. think it's like the IPL. The IPL, uh, they play a match every day or even two games a day and they just get on with it. And I think that to do that, you want to find out who the best cricket nation is. Let's find out who's got the best 28 players. And so I'd just say, like, England are playing there, three days later there, there, there. And you just make them take bigger squads and play more. Yeah. Hmm. Um, the, the, the thing that really sort of seemed to emerge was, was Brendan McCullum as hero, really. Yeah. I, I heard that he's basically as big as Richie McCaw there now, that his face is everywhere, over, advertising everything, posters everywhere. Yeah, yeah. It was a very um, symbolic when he was bowled third ball of the final, actually, because it, that was, it was just a procession after that. It, yeah. was, it was game over, wasn't it? I think it did show the uh, kind of an immutable law of cricket, that if someone is bowling 95 mile an hour in swinging Yorkers at you, take a couple of balls to play yourself in. Yeah. Don't just try and smack it for <laughs> six Have a look straight away. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, we get to see him this summer, obviously, yeah. England New Zealand series. Uh, is he gonna, he's just going to... He's just going to thrash us around, isn't he? Uh, do you know what? I've, it's, this might be a controversial thing to say, but I think that it's, it's quite an exciting time for English cricket, actually, when you look at a team like that middle order. Butler, Stokes can bat lower down. If you get Hales in, I think Ali, there's a lot of all-rounders, great in the field. They're a really exciting young side. And I think um, 
we might not do that well this summer, but I think it's the first time I've been excited about an England team for a while, actually. I know the results don't show that at the moment, but that's how I feel about it, yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. I mean, you know, some people have got to be excited. <laughs> You've just got to remember that, really, our season goes against everybody else's season. And so our players are not getting the exposure of this high-pressure cricket, IPL, Big Bash, a few are going. But Indian players, I mean, they said they'll do the IPL, but young England Indian players are getting unbelievable experience and aggressive cricket. Best players in the world coming to play against them. And the great thing that India have done, they've just said there must be X amount of Indians in this site. And we're being left behind because we're saying to our players, you go there, you won't get an England contract. We've got to find a solution to that because they, they, they've got to be given the chance. We've got to change the brand of our cricket. We've got to play the aggressive. India don't care about Test cricket anymore. We do and we will because the public do and it's a big part of what we do in England. But the rest of the world, apart from Australia, England series, New Zealand series, they're not going to care about it. Mm. How do you feel we correct that? Do you think it should be corrected? I think you've got to talk to your players and, and say, right, who is playing in the IPL? You know, the, the one thing is we've got to decide how we're going to fit in with the rest of the world, not how the rest of the world is going to fit in with us, because they're not. Yeah. So unless we change, something's going to go wrong. Yeah. Wasn't the uh, Chennai Super Kings up for sale for about £2,000 the other day? Could we not just buy the franchise and move it to Canterbury. That's a great idea. Well, do, you, do, you know, do you know what's really, what's really strange? Off the wall, why not be a franchise, play X amount of in Indians with X amount of your six, seven, 25-year-olds who you think are going to be the next big thing? I what, think... I, I, don't, I don't know the answer, but we can't be just sat away from the rest of the world. I, it's, I, there's actually, I had a quote, I, I was reading... Um, I was reading Mike Atherton's uh, autobiography recently. No reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, <laughs> and uh, he actually he wrote about why um, England, uh, it, the England One Day team, did so badly in the 90s, or, or why, why they were getting passed by. And he said other countries. He wrote this what 10, 15 years ago. Other countries were sharpening their skills in tournaments elsewhere. We stood haughtily by. And I thought that sounds exactly like what's happening right now. Um, but Alex, mm. I think I think you've possibly got something to show Well, I've got one quick question for you, Felix, if that's all right. This, uh, the Maccabees were nominated uh, for the Music Mercury Prize in 2012. How often do you think about Dean Headley getting six wickets in <laughs> Melbourne? <laughs> <laughs> More often, probably. <laughs> Not yet. He doesn't even know. That's really refreshing, because at least you know. Well, I remember Dean playing for England when I was first falling in love with cricket, so it's actually amazing to <laughs> sit next to Dean Headley. So we've got, we've got poetry. Yet. We've got some poetry now. Go on. Yeah. So we've got some poetry. We invited Tim Key, the poet, to come and perform here. Uh, but he went to the Crucible to watch the snooker instead. So um, he's recorded a little video. Um, eight years ago, he recorded this. And uh, <laughs> it's got some cricket in it. Um, I'm actually in the video beardless but wearing white. So uh, it's vaguely relevant to this evening. So this is uh, Tim Key's poet. <laughs> they measured out the distance. <laughs> they had booze, sweets. <laughs> Matt Turner wore crookety clothes. Meanwhile, Chris Sawyer, who had done this thing once or twice before, wore a kimono and a Peruvian hat. Chris, <laughs> 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 
gun. I don't really understand it, but it's, you know, it's something. It's still crickety, isn't it? Crickety, it's crickety. crickety poem. Crickety and sort of disturbing. <sighs> yeah. A lot slimmer then. I think it was uh, an allegory on the uh, Kevin Peterson sacking from <laughs> last year, wasn't it? We've, we've got a game next. Another game. Yay! Ooh, good, you're excited too. Um, so this, this game is called um, Alistair Cook or Alistair Cook. So uh, what we've done is, um, obviously, really, obvious game to do, we have uh, taken some quotes uh, that were either spoken by the England cricket captain or were, were spoken by the former foreign correspondent of The Guardian and the voice of letter from America. Uh, and we would like, uh, we would like you guys to um, uh, quickly look at them and uh, tell us which one was which. So let's look at the first one. It was a great feeling to see that ball go through for four. It was unbelievable. It might be a cliche, but this really is a dream come true. Um, thoughts? Oh, oh no. It was Alistair Cook. It was yeah. Alistair Cook. Well done. Correct. Uh, that was the captain. Oh, no, 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 no. He was quoting Alistair Cook, the, uh, the <laughs> letter from America. He played a game of cricket against Lyndon B. Johnson in the Oval Office. Um, and that's what led to the Vietnam War, in fact. So, it was like, uh, if, if, if Johnson lost, then no war. Uh, then, then war. And if Johnson won, then peace. But... Alistair Cook. Oh, so OK, pre, so I've, I've misattributed that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next one. Man has an incurable habit of not fulfilling the prophecies of his fellow men. Alistair Cook or Alistair Cook? Alistair Cook. E, e or no E? E. E, yeah, yeah, that, that, very good. You're getting into the hang, hang of this. Uh, n <laughs> next one. Did he not say that after Jonathan Trott had, uh, had a bad first <laughs> test? <laughs> we prophesied that he'd do well. I mean, it does sound like something that, that he might say. It takes a long time to gain respect, but it takes one moment to lose it. Alistair Cook or Alistair Cook? Kevin <laughs> Peterson. Uh, what, what, what do you reckon, Felix? That is England captain Alistair Cook. That's correct. Well done. Very good. Uh, these humiliations are the essence of the game. Kevin Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> Captain or journalist? Dean. There's got to be a trick one in journalist. Uh, it is. And do you know what? He wasn't speaking about cricket. He was speaking about golf. So there you go. Uh, what th kind of golf was he playing? Was this crazy golf? Or what? <laughs> Did he get attacked by a windmill? <laughs> a professional is someone who can do his best work when he doesn't feel like it. Journalist or uh, England cricket captain? Anyone? It's very good. Oh, these are just too easy. Uh, next one. Music and cricket use different parts of the brain. Jazz requires you to improvise, be creative, where batting is primarily reactive. <laughs> uh, ca captain, captain or letter from America? Journalist? Journalist. Journalist. Yes. You're wrong. You're wrong. That's, a, that's exactly what was going through Alistair Cook's head that time that Mitchell Johnson bowled him with a 95 mile an hour out. <laughs> Alistair Cook. Actually, the, Alice Cook, the test captain, actually said that to me. That was a quote he said to me when we were talking about his clarinet playing. Oh. Um, <laughs> in, in the best of times, our days are numbered anyway. That was, that was the journalist. Actually, it goes on to say, so it would be a crime against nature for any generation to take the world crisis so solemnly that it put off enjoying those things for which we were designed in the first place. And then he includes to hit a ball as one of those things. Uh, and I think this is the last one. Sheep are never going to talk to you about cricket. Is that a spit, England captain. England captain, because obviously, famously, he, he does do He's a bit a farmer, of isn't he? sheep farming. Yes, mm. he actually said, um, "Sheep are never going yeah. to talk to you about cricket. They don't care. You have to go out and feed them, whether it's raining or hot. It's good escapism." There I am in some mucky old clothes and a beaten up pickup truck, and off I go. <laughs> so <laughs> there oh, we go. Bless. Very much bless like fast bowlers, I've heard. Isn't that right? Um, Alex, you've you've. Dan's got another song. We've got two songs, two very Whoa. short songs. We've got one song uh, specifically about uh, Ian Botham and then one about Billy Bowden. So this is the right place for these songs, probably. Um, Will, do you want to do... Um, could you just play just a B? Just give us a note, just a B. 
That's it. And then an E. That's it. And then one more of them. And then an F. And then another E. There we go. That spells beefy. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> beefy. Okay. That's the first one. Beefy. Play it again. Play the whole thing. E E F E. There we go. That's beefy. And uh, Billy Bowden. Do you want to do the Billy Bowden song? Yeah. Yeah. So we didn't. Uh, we're not. Do you have faith in this song? <laughs> yes. Never done it before. Have no. We? I don't think we'll do it again. But we Probably haven't done, not. I don't think we're going to do it now, actually. No, we're not going to do it. <laughs> no, we will. Yeah, we will do it. Yeah, this, this, this is a Billy Bowden song. I went on a bird watching trip with Billy Bowden. It was very disappointing. He kept spotting bird after bird I couldn't see. And it was very hard to tell where he was pointing. <laughs> Went down much better than we thought it was going to go down. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah, very good. Pleasantly surprised. Yeah, me too, yeah. And you didn't do it very well. You got the last line slightly wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well done, though. There we go. Yeah, Joe Walton. Took a month. Took a month to write that. It's lovely. I once had lunch with Billy Bowden. Um, yeah. Uh, I kept watching his finger, because, you know, he says he can't straighten his finger, and that's why, when he gives people out, his finger goes like that, because he's arthritis. got arthritis. But he, he straightened it out when he picked up a knife, is all I'm going to say. Just, you know, How did he sneaky. pick up the knife? <laughs> <laughs> why would he... He conducts electricity. Go, if you see him at a fairground, he puts on a pair of roller skates, <laughs> and he just goes on the dodge <laughs> 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 What is his excuse for doing... That. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Got stuck in a lift when he was... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but he's just... Um, he just tries to be the centre of attention. He's, a, he's obviously a good umpire because you can't get to that level. But, you know, and there's these days of rock and... Well, rock and roll cricket, if you like, where people are trying to become superstars. You know, referees in rugby, in rugby and um, in football do it, so I can't see why it's a problem somebody trying to create a character. Bob Willis hates him, though. He really does, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. But he does him, hate though. everybody. He hates everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He hates us. <laughs> if you yeah. said he liked him, I'd be amazed. Yeah. In fact, I'd, I'd fall off this chair. Were there any umpires that you particularly hated bowling in front of who you thought were never going to give you anything? Dickie Bird. Isn't that really nice chap? But uh, Dickie, Dickie basically, unless you hit middle stump with the X halfway up the stump, not even clipping any of the other two stumps, he wouldn't give it out. <laughs> because it's one of those things, what you find, Ray Julian was brilliant. Like, I took, I, would, I happened to have a really good season one year. I took three first class hat tricks in a year. And it's a, it's a equal to world record. And basically, Ray Julian was stood with two Hampshire players coming in at 10 and 11, and he said to me, he said, uh, you've taken two hat-tricks this year, haven't you? <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, what more would be a world record? Uh, LBW, next bloke, and uh, Boval came in, and I think he put his finger up before he... <laughs> <laughs> and, and to be fair, I see him quite a bit now, and he shakes my hand and he says, uh, we've got a world record. <laughs> Just to, just to bring us back round to the West Indies, um, uh, I know, Andy, you haven't, you haven't been to the no. Caribbean. Um, Dean obviously has toured there. Felix, have you, have you been? Never been, no. Okay. I have. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, so uh, one of the things that I really loved about it was the, um, you know, the carnival spirit uh, uh, that is still, um, you know, a big part of the cricket there. People say that, you know, especially in Antigua, since, since uh, things moved out of um, the old St John's ground, which had amazing atmosphere, and moved to the new big purpose-built ground outside the city, uh, they say it's lost a lot of the atmosphere. But that is not what I experienced, actually. Um, I think the, uh, the carnival spirit is very much still alive um, uh, in, in West Indies cricket. I've got a clip that proves it, actually. This is a carnival going on, and this is, uh... Oh, 
I mean, that is the proof right there. That's Alex Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he was just loving it. He was loving it. I mean, no, I... But, no, no, but to be fair, you've got Barbados, you've got the old gun of Barbados. You, I mean, the roof used to come off the place. Yeah. And Antigua. <laughs> Antigua used to have a stand that literally moved. Yeah. It was a wooden stand yeah. and it moved. Yeah. And there were people hanging off every rafter. And because it's so small, and every day you'd have a musician, so someone like David Rudder, and he'd come in, and he'd just be in the crowd, just getting, you know, and somebody would bring a, a speaker and a microphone, and he'd just start performing. So between each ball or lunch times, and the whole crowd, uh, the whole stand would just, you know, yeah. get down to it, and Barbados the same. Um, Barbados is quite scary once it once it goes. The the atmosphere and these grounds were small, and then when they made them bigger, they lost a bit of the atmosphere. Yeah, I, I think well, I think it's. Do you know? Did. I mean, I, d I don't like to argue with you. You obviously know a lot, a more, lot better about these things. But I've just got one more clip that I'd like to show, which I, th I think also proves proves again my point. Um, there is a party stand in Antigua, and there are some dancing girls, uh, and this is this is a this is a travelling fan. Getting into the dancing with the dancing girls, I think you will agree. He's, he's actually choreographing, by the, by the way. If you watch, they are actually following him here. I mean, this, is, this was one of the best things I saw at the cricket. Everyone, everyone stopped watching the cricket at this point, by the way. Everyone was just watching this guy on... And he, he got on the big screen. That's how big a deal it was. And, and what I would say is, I mean, if, look, and look at the way he finishes off. I, if only, you know, uh, this just doesn't do it justice at all. You, 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 you're seeing it on video. But if only I could show you these moves in real life. I mean, if we, if, if only, like, there was some way to show. Hello. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's Sean the Cricket fan. Come, come, come join us. Oh, there aren't any stairs for you. Come, come, come around this side. Please welcome our next guest. Oh, that nearly got awkward. Uh, have, do, do, do you want to have that seat? You, you go ahead and have that seat. It did get no, Sean, Sean, it did get uh, we, we don't have much time, but I, I've got to ask how much rum punch had been drunk at that stage? Several. Several. Several, several rum punches. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I must say, you do look fitter in real life. <laughs> <laughs> Have another look, Dave. <laughs> and, and where did you get the moves from? Where, um, where did you learn those? Rum punch. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were just out there for the first test, that's yeah. right, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, and you weren't actually, you're not officially a bar, you're not official Barmy Army. I'm a Barmy Army member. Right. Yeah, but I went on my own. But you went on your own. Yeah. And you, you, you... Barmy Army. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that was that was guerrilla stuff. You just went you just yes. went out there and just yes. took it on. Yes. Um, did you have a lot to drink? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. And did you realise at the time what a sensation you were becoming? No, not till Stuart Broad tweeted it and put it on Facebook. <laughs> and, and then people were stopping me going out of the ground and getting photos. <laughs> <laughs> but you were, you weren't shy of the limelight because you did actually get up again and do it the next day, yeah, didn't yeah, you, Sean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he did. He did. Free t-shirt. Yeah, he, he got free t-shirt. In fact, um, in fact, we've got we've got a little we've got a little clip to show you actually. Um, I think this clip um, possibly needs a bit of mood music, bit something romantic maybe. Yeah, you play something. Yeah. Do you know what to do?
because one of your friends did start calling you Tiny Dancer, didn't oh, they? Yeah. I remember that when we were out there. He said, yeah, Tiny Dancer. <laughs> um, so I, I can't have you on the stage without asking you to teach me and the guests no. your signature move. <laughs> so um, whichever, whichever one you want to, whichever one you want to teach us. Um, I, I, I think I think maybe this one. If we can have a little bit of that one. Have we got have we got some have we got some music that we could we could play? Alex, I hope you're going to join me dancing. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. I, yeah you are. I don't think I will. So um, we play the cricket theme probably. Yeah. Right. Come on, Andy. Come on. Give this a go. joined in. <laughs> I tweaked a hamstring early on. Actually, funny enough, that was Sean's excuse on the second day, wasn't it? Yeah. Tweaking a hamstring. So in Antigua, this, this is Antigua, yeah? This so, is Antigua, so yeah. So did you visit the most famous place to visit in Antigua? I don't know what Apart is Apart from the cricket, did you go Shirley Heights? Yeah. Shirley Heights, yeah. yeah. On yeah. a Sunday? On a Sunday. Full, full, of, full of English tourists. In a good way. It's, a, it's the highest part of Antigua, and oh, every right. Sunday the whole island goes there to this nice. one place. And I think it only opens once a week. <laughs> <laughs> it makes enough money in one night. So, yeah. It was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and great views of the sunset. And which place did you see there? <laughs> no. no, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All home in bed. Um, Alex, you've got one more. We got one more song, haven't we? Before well, we it's not up. really a song. It's just it's it's. A, I've just got a top ten of funny cricketing names, people like Jack Russell. And it ends, it, you know, there's some quite nice ones. Uh, you might not have heard of all of them, but we've got to put it to music and then it makes it seem better. <laughs> so if I just say them, then it's just a man talking, but if they're playing, <laughs> slightly better. So I'll just read that out if you want. There we go. <laughs> Number 10, we've got Graham Onions. It's a funny Graham name, Onions. Onions. Oh, yeah, Will will sing some of them. He goes well with Phil Mustard and Anna Lamb and Graham Swan. At number 9, Napoleon Einstein. A genuine cricketer, part of the India under 19 World Cup winning squad in 2008. He's not famous. At number 8, Neville Broom. A Kiwi cricketer. Sometimes the commentator says things like, Broom swept the ball, and that's funny. At number 7, we've got Victor Trumper. Victor Trumper, an, an Aussie who died 100 years ago. At number 6, Gosnell Cupid. He plays for the RSVG police team in the West Indies. He's a part-time cricketer. We're halfway. <laughs> At number five, David Womble. David Womble. He played for Staffordshire. At number four, Roger Binney, the Indian all-rounder whose nickname was Rubbish. Rubbish Binney. Cricketers are funny. At number three, Jack Crap. He played for England in 1948 but had to retire from cricket because of a skin condition. At number two, Roy Virgin. He played for Northamptonshire in the 70s. He's got eight children. He's not a virgin. And number one, Andrew Dick. There we go. So he's an Aussie who uh, made a single first-class appearance for Victoria in the 1853-54 to 54 season. He got three runs in the first innings and one in the second. Andrew Dick. There we go. Woo! Right. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. 
Hey, England had a player in the 1890s called Dick Power. I can't... <laughs> Yeah, he was number 11. <laughs> Got, yeah, it's unfortunate. Didn't make it. <laughs> Prefer and Gosnell keeping. I think you should look into nicknames of cricketers. Next time. And I reckon there'll okay. be some good ones. Ne- What's your nickname, team? A uh, frog. Oh, yeah. That's good. Frog? Yeah. Yeah. Only very few people call me froggy. Right. Oh, because you persuade people in French. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, the opposition wouldn't. Just uh, certain people, Min Patel, people like that, call me Froggy. Because I told a joke about the wide mouth frog, which I'm not telling tonight. <laughs> <laughs> because I told it once at a dinner, it got videoed, and now all the kids at school, the first thing that comes up, Dean Headley, is me telling a joke called the wide mouth frog. Uh, it's on YouTube. That's it, really. It's on YouTube. But yeah, it is, yeah. Because yeah. we've got the. <laughs> we've got the internet. Yeah, yeah. Can we just queue that up? No, no, no. no. We, don't, we don't have time to queue up. We're going to have to wrap it up. We're going to have to wrap it up here. Um, but I just want to thank you all very, very much. Thank you to our fantastic guests, to Felix White, to Dean Headley, to Andy Zelsman. Um, you, uh, the, you can see the Maccabees. They are touring from May the 11th. Yep. Uh, their single is out now. Correct. Uh, and an album is on its way. We don't know what it's called. We're not allowed to know yet. But it's going to be really good, and you can hear all the songs presumably on tour from May the 11th. Yeah, most of them, yeah. Uh, Andy's going to be uh, performing at the Udderbelly Festival on M- May the 7th. Election night. Yeah. Election night. <laughs> um, and thank you again so much to, uh, to to the band, to the horn section, and Alex. Alex is going to be performing at the Soho Theatre on May the 4th. Also, extra thanks to Ben Green, Richard Springer, Ed Cumming, and Rob Biddle. And with that, we're going to bid you good night. Good night. Yeah.